Despite this channel being known for covering my issues with the current era of Doctor Who, one thing I haven't actually done is review each episode in depth and really give you guys a clear understanding of where I think these episodes succeed and fail. So that's what I've decided to do, and where better to start than the first episode of Series 11, The Woman Who Fell to Earth. Subscribe and buckle up, boys and girls, because we're going on a trip to Sheffield. <laughs> The story picks up right where Twice Upon a Time left off, with the 13th Doctor crash landing in Sheffield where she meets her new companions, Graham, Yaz, Ryan and his nan Grace. But strange things are afoot in Sheffield, as a warrior from a distant planet named Tazim Shah. Tim Shaw? Tim Shaw. Tim Shaw? Tim Shaw is hunting a human in order to be crowned king of his species, who is also linked to other strange occurrences, such as a bizarre tentacle monster and a mysterious pod that keeps appearing throughout the town, and the story follows the Doctor and her crew trying to figure out how these things fit together. Now I know you guys like to hear me tear this era apart, but I'd like to start off with the positives, to ease in the newcomers, and to be fair, this will be one of my more positive reviews for the series. The episode is very well shot, with the production crew really making the most of the new cameras that were brought on for this reboot of the show, that managed to make Sheffield look very picturesque. This also extends to the visual effects, which, whilst not being particularly flashy, feel tangible and real, which adds to the immersion. I would argue that Woman Who Fell to Earth feels grander in scope than any other episode in the series, due to some large set pieces, in addition to the fact that the newly appointed TARDIS team have to travel across an entire city in one night. Most of the performances are solid enough, with the standout definitely being Bradley Walsh's Graham, who feels like the most down-to-earth character, which is ironic when you consider that he's the biggest name on the cast. There are also some fun scenes, with the sonic screwdriver construction scene being the best example, despite it just being a different means to the same end. I like that Yaz has some agency in the story, as she appears to be a commanding presence in her initial scene especially, where she has to defuse a heated parking dispute. Can I suggest a simple solution? You pay for a cracked window, you pay for a scratched door, and we all agree that parking around here is a nightmare. To me, this episode suffers with a severe case of what I like to call First Episode Syndrome, which can even be found in fantastic episodes like The Eleventh Hour, as loads of supporting characters are established in Ledworth that we never see again. Except this time, the problem is amplified tenfold, due to the fact that many of the main characters' goals, dynamics, and even traits are established in this episode and then never brought up again. This includes Ryan's conflict with Graham, which is all but resolved by the end of the episode. Don't believe me? Just compare this interaction between Ryan and Graham and the woman who fell to Earth. What have I done? I suppose you'll be blaming this on the dyspraxia as well. Can't ride a bike, started an alien invasion. Graham? To this one in the Ghost Monument. What do we do? Should we just follow her? Yeah. Uh. Other examples include Ryan's YouTube, which appears to only have been shown in order to easily communicate Ryan's emotions without any nuance or subtlety. He has his desire to quote unquote do more for the police force which to be fair was an extremely vague goal to begin with, and even Yaz's more authoritative personality, something that I praised earlier, has basically dissipated by the time you get to episodes like Arachnids in the UK. Speaking of things I said earlier in the video, remember how I said that most of the performances were solid? Well there's a reason for that, as Toes and Cole as Ryan Sinclair is as monotone and unenthusiastic as ever. I was also surprised by how little Jodie Whittaker's performance as the Doctor had evolved since this initial episode, with her struggling to be as commanding or expressive as her predecessors, which I think is best exemplified in her first speech as the Doctor, which, in my opinion, doesn't nearly have the impact that it should. Upon first viewing the episode, I remember thinking that her basic characterization was a result of her experiencing post-regeneration trauma, but now that we're two series in, I can safely say that this was not the case, as the happy, quirky, generic routine started here and hasn't really stopped since. In fact, you could make the argument that she feels more like the Doctor here due to the fact that she wears the damaged clothes of the 12th Doctor throughout, which to me make her resemble the Doctor far more than what she would eventually wear, which could be down to the fact that there's something very alien about watching a young woman dash about in an old man's suit. Surprisingly though, the difference in gender didn't feel nearly as strange as it did when I first watched the episode. This is likely down to the fact that the novelty of it has passed, and I'm not swept up in the internet discourse like I was in 2018. Although I think it was a wise decision not to make it the focal point of the story, like the title would suggest, which makes it feel a bit more natural. Despite the fact that there were some fun scenes, there were also scenes that were completely pointless, with the best example in my opinion being the 13th Doctor's nap, 
which is something the Doctor traditionally does in episodes where the companions are already familiar with the Doctor, so that they can discuss their doubts about this new incarnation. However, without that previous relationship existing, there's nothing for the companions to discuss. Tonally and pacing wise, this story is all over the place going from scenes where a man talks about his dead sister, to a scene in which another man throws salad at the beetle. The cinematography also contributes to this, as despite it looking great, the dark visuals really don't fit the more comical scenes. In terms of pacing though, some scenes feel too brief, like the one where Ryan and Yaz meet each other which gives important context to their relationship, and others feel too long, like the aforementioned Sonic screwdriver scene, making the final product feel too long in all the wrong places. Tazim Shah is a serviceable villain for an opening episode, remember that because it's going to be important later in the series, although he is so much more threatening with his mask on. When he took it off, I just imagined the casual audience going, yep, it's still a kid's show. The music from freshman composer Sega Nakanola is serviceable but very forgettable which to be fair, applies to most of the episodes of the series, so I won't be covering it in any of the other episodes unless it's in some way unique. Although I will say that the ambience of the score works better in this episode than it does in others, because it reflects how quiet Sheffield is at night. Speaking of music, I think they made a mistake when they decided not to include the title sequence in the episode, as fans already had to accept a lot of changes and the title sequence could have helped reassure people that this was the same show. One word. Simplify. This story had to set up a new Doctor, three new companions, four if you include Grace, a whole new tone and style, and the main character arc of the series. So this story needed to be as simple as possible in order to accommodate for all this. So why do we spend so much time establishing unnecessary MacGuffins and side characters? If you remove the tentacle monsters and pods and make Tim Shaw's target Grace rather than some random side character, then not only does Graham's desire to kill Tim Shaw feel a lot more impactful, but by removing all the fluff, the pacing becomes significantly better. As you can devote more time to fleshing out the new Doctor and her team. In short, if you get the story right, the rest will follow. Other than that, I would stay stick to the gritty realistic tone that I think this episode was going for, as it would help distinguish this era more effectively from its fairy tale like predecessor. This episode provides a decent enough base for a new series of Doctor Who to build off of, but it's obvious that improvements needed to be made for Series 11 to be considered another successful series of the long-running sci-fi show. But the question is, did it? Did Series 11 build on the base that this episode set up? No. But more on that next time as we head on over to the Sahara Desert to battle with some toilet paper. Insert funny pandemic joke here. Thanks for watching, and I will see you later.